Hello viewers, welcome to NIOS studio on the subject of introduction to law. I am Dr. Victor Webhoff Tandon and today we are going to discuss the topic Indian judicial system. Now dear students, we are going to discuss in this lecture the history of the origin and development of Indian judicial system, the structure of the judiciary in India, the hierarchy of the judicial system as well as the jurisdiction of our Supreme Court, the High Courts and the working of the subordinate courts. We will also look at some of the lacuna or problems in the Indian judicial system and we are going to look at some of the more important latest judicial trends in India. So, when we talk about Indian judicial system, we are going to focus on the growth and structure of our judiciary and we are going to understand the justice delivery system in India. Before we start, we have to understand that the efficacy of any judicial system depends essentially on two factors. Firstly, the existence of well-defined hierarchy of courts and secondly, the fact that courts should follow a simple procedure and a uniform and well-defined system of law. So with these two principles in mind, we now move on. Dear friends, as you all know, courts and laws are important instruments of justice. They are means to an end, not the end in themselves. So when we talk about courts and laws, we want both of them, our courts, our judiciary, as well as our laws to be fair and reasonable. These fair and reasonable laws and a fair and reasonable court system is required to maintain fairness and justice in our society. So bearing these things in mind, let us now look at the objectives of our current discussion. So our current discussion is essentially going to focus on firstly the history of the origin and development of Indian judicial system. Secondly, we are going to look at the structure of the judiciary in India. Thirdly, we will identify the hierarchy of our judicial system. Fourthly, we are going to explain the jurisdiction of our Supreme Court, the different high courts and the working of our subordinate courts. Fifthly, we are going to look at the lacuna or some of the problems in our judicial system. And lastly, we are going to highlight couple of latest judicial trends in India. So moving on dear friends, we will first start with the origin and history of the judicial system in our country. Well, the judicial system in our country can be traced back to the pre-British era. Now, most of us tend to think that the judiciary and the entire judicial system that we have in our country is actually a product of the British Raj. Well, that is just a myth because the judicial system in India did not really start with the advent of the British rule. Even before the Britishers came, there existed a robust judicial system in our country and reference of the same can be found in Dharmshastras, which are as old as 5000 years old. Now, Dharamshastras tell us, dear students, that there were elaborate laws on all aspects of human behavior and life even in ancient India. The one unique feature of this era is that law and religion were often mixed together and there were sanctions or punishments for every non-observance of law. 
Also, when we talk about the Mauryan dynasty, from the times of King Chandragupta Maurya and his grandson King Ashoka, as well as to the time of King Kanishk and other prominent Hindu rulers, we see that they all had an organized system of laws and courts. There were civil, criminal and revenue justice systems well in place even in ancient India. The next important era, dear students, is the Mughal rule. And the Mughals, when they came, they introduced their own laws for the judicial administration in the Mughal territories. Now, one unique element of all these different legal systems which existed in India before the Britishers came was that different parts of India were ruled by different dynasties and they all had their own laws and judicial systems leading to inconsistency and lack of uniformity in the laws and justice system throughout the country because there were different territories ruled by different rulers all of them had different laws and different conceptions of justice and different judicial systems. Often, the kings used to deliver justice as per their whims and fancies, which is wrong. And often, these systems were also heavily influenced by the religion of the kings in question. So, one of the major impacts of the British Raj was to introduce uniformity in the laws and judicial system of our country. How did that happen? We will now look at that. So, as we said that the British rule led to uniformity and consistency in our judicial systems. When the Britishers came, they largely discarded the earlier systems, which therefore become irrelevant for the purpose of our study. Now, the judicial system during the British rule can be neatly divided into about six phases. The first of these phases was when the system of judiciary under the British Raj was taking shape. The system was in its infancy or it was in its nascent or early stages. The Britishers had initially settled in Surat, Bombay and Madras and it was the East India Company which was conducting business in our country. What the East India Company established was a very elementary judicial systems where they resolved their commercial disputes mutually amongst themselves. Now because it was not formally the British government or the Queen, but the East India Company, which was ruling over these three cities of Surat, Bombay and Madras. So the judicial system that they established was manned or was controlled by non-legal persons, officials who had no formal knowledge of law or justice. And another important feature was that in the early phases, the judiciary was subordinate to the executive, which is against the principles of separation of powers, as you will soon find out, dear students. So we come to now the second phase. The second phase starts with the establishment of the Supreme Court of Judicature at Fort William, Calcutta, under the Regulation Act of 1773. Now this Supreme Court of Judicature, dear students, comprised of professional English judges who were well versed with both law and legal practice. Not only did the Supreme Court of Judicature at Fort William had professional English judges, it also had a professional English bar, where the bar is a collective of the lawyers. So there were professional English lawyers to assist the court. Now this was, as you can see, a marked improvement over having an informal system as the East India Company had initially established. In the third phase, dear students, 
the East India Company administered justice in Bengal by introducing the Adalat system in the Mufassils. Now, this Adalat system was manned by British executive civil servants who once again had no legal training. Later, the civil matters were brought under the control of judiciary, but the criminal administration remained with the executive, and that is why the district collector became a very powerful official, because the district collector now performed twin functions. The collector was in charge or responsible for the executive functions as well, and also for the criminal administration of the Mofasil. In the fourth phase, we find that the dual system of courts in the presidency towns and the Mofasil areas was unified. The Supreme Court and Sadar Adalals of the presidency towns were abolished, and in their place, High Courts were established for the first time in 1861. And in some ways, dear students, this can be said to be the precursor of the modern system of law and justice in India. In the fifth phase, we find that the Privy Council became the highest court of appeal from India. This phase also saw the establishment of the first law commission in 1833, which led to robust creation of new laws for India. Interestingly, dear students, law commission is a concept we still have till this day. We do have law commissions which are set up periodically for review of laws in India and for suggesting amendments in our laws. In the sixth and final phase, dear students, we find the introduction of the Government of India Act 1935. This Government of India Act of 1935 in many ways became the template or the precursor to our modern Indian constitution. Also, in this phase, we see the establishment of federal courts of India. Now, these federal courts, dear students, act as an intermediate between the high courts and the privy council. As I told you, the privy council was the highest court of appeal. So, now between the high courts in India and the privy council, there was established a federal court. Now, the federal court interpreted the Indian Constitution, which is the Government of India Act of 1935, but it could only declare the law. It could only lay down what the law was or interpret the law. It could not ensure exact compliance with its decisions, because that was not within its authority. Now, after the end of the sixth phase, we come to the post-independence era. We gained independence from the British rule in 1947 and we were tasked with establishing a new society, a new future for the newly independent India. And the newly independent India, India's constitution came into force on 26th January 1950. And the constitution gave prime place to the judiciary, which was envisaged as a guardian of our rights. The interesting feature of our constitution was that it established an independent and unitary judiciary. Independent because the constitution laid down separation of powers, so the judiciary was independent of the other organs of the state, namely the executive and the legislature, which implies that the legislature and the executive could not control the judiciary. It was fair, it was independent. And as you can guess, dear students, the Privy Council and every other courts of British rule were 
no longer there because they were now replaced by the Indian judicial system with Supreme Court at the top. Under the current Indian judicial system, we see that there are uniform codified laws on almost all matters and these laws are applicable to the whole of the country and all the people, all the citizens. As I said earlier, we also now have a unified and independent judiciary with Supreme Court at the very top. And there is emphasis in our society on the rule of law, which implies that what governs us is the rule of law, not the rule of men. And there is lot of emphasis in our society on ensuring justice for all the people. So in such a society, our constitution emerges as supreme and it establishes a legal system. In India, all the laws which derive their validity, their legitimacy from our constitution. And it is the constitution which has established, as I told you before, the judiciary and all the other organs of the state. Now, because the judiciary is independent, it has the power to exercise checks on the other organs of the state which means that judiciary keeps a check on the executive and the legislature. It does not allow them to abuse their power. The judiciary also protects the fundamental rights of all citizens. My fundamental rights, your fundamental rights, and also other rights of the people. And lastly, the judiciary interprets and protects the constitution of India and it interprets all the other laws of the land. So now, having given you a brief background about the growth of Indian judicial system, we now look at the structure of our judicial system or the structure of our judiciary. As I have said many times before, we have a single Supreme Court at the top and underneath it, are 21 high courts for the states. Now, as a general rule, we have one high court for each state. But because, as you can see, we only have 21 high courts, some states share high courts. For example, Punjab and Haryana has a single high court. And underneath the high courts, we have subordinate courts in each and every district of the country. So, our Supreme Court was established on 26 January 1950 under Article 124 of our Constitution. It has its seat in New Delhi and the present strength of Supreme Court is 31 judges. Directly below the Supreme Court, as I said, we have 21 High Courts which were established under Article 214 of the Constitution and each High Court has a Chief Justice and other judges. Below the High Courts, we have subordinate courts in each and every district of our country. These are the first place, dear students, where you go with your cases. So civil cases are dealt by civil courts and criminal cases are dealt by criminal courts. Now, as far as the jurisdiction is concerned, the Supreme Court has primarily five distinct kinds of jurisdiction. It has original jurisdiction under Article 131 of the Constitution and under its original jurisdiction, it can try disputes between the union and the state, between one state and the another and between a group of states on the one hand and another group of states. Now, it has writ jurisdiction also under Article 32 of the Constitution and this writ jurisdiction or the power to issue rates is for the protection of fundamental rights of the citizens. Thirdly, our Supreme Court has appealed jurisdiction and it can hear appeals of essentially three kinds. Number one, those which involve interpretation of the constitution. Number two, all appeals from civil cases. And number three, all appeals from criminal cases. And please remember, dear students, our Supreme Court is the highest court of appeal in India. Now, 
Supreme Court also has advisory jurisdiction under Article 143. Advisory jurisdiction implies that whenever the President of India seeks any advice regarding any question of law or a fact of public importance, the President can seek advice from the Supreme Court. And because it is merely an advisory opinion, it is not binding on the President or the government. Lastly, the Supreme Court also has review jurisdiction. This is a very unique thing. The Supreme Court has the power to review any judgment or order which is pronounced by it. Dear students, we now look briefly at the jurisdiction of our high courts. All the high courts, like the Supreme Court, are court of records and they can punish for their contempt. Each high court has jurisdiction within the territory of the state concerned. And each high court also has writ jurisdiction under Article 226 of the Constitution for violation of our fundamental rights and all the other rights. The high courts also have original jurisdiction for settlement of disputes relating to elections to the union parliament or the state legislature. And the high courts also have appealed jurisdiction over civil and criminal matters in the state concern. They hear appeals from the district courts. Now, importantly, the high courts also have power, administrative authority over all the subordinate courts or district courts in the state concerned. And they can transfer any case from the subordinate court to itself. Coming to the subordinate courts, as I told you before, subordinate courts or district courts exist for each and every district and they come under the superintendence and control of the high court of the state concerned. Now, even within district courts, there are sub hierarchies. For example, there are additional district courts, sub courts, Munsif magistrate courts, court of special judicial magistrate and court of special munsif magistrates. Now, dear students, having given you the brief history of origin of our judiciary as well as its structure and jurisdiction, we now briefly look at some of the problems which plague our judiciary. One of the foremost problems which plagues our judiciary is the overburdening of all courts, whether it is Supreme Court, or high courts or subordinate courts, dear students, all of them are overburdened with a lot of matters. And another problem which our judiciary faces is that we have very little infrastructure. There is an extreme lack of adequate infrastructure in our judiciary. There is interference by executive, especially in the lower courts, and sadly, even the bar or the lawyers are guilty of indulging in corrupt practices and demanding adjournments or dates. There is corruption, unfortunately, at the clerical level in district courts, and there is influence of touts or professional witnesses, witnesses who can be purchased for money and who are basically fake witnesses. These are all problems which plague our judiciary, which hold us back. Apart from this, another sad reality of Indian judiciary is the extreme high cost of litigation and the incompetence of lawyers at district level. Now, how do we counter this? At least two recent judicial trends are there. I told you that there is high cost of litigation in India and more often than not, poor people are not able to afford approaching the courts for their problem. Also our population is not educated enough and they are not aware when their rights are violated. So what do we do for making or for ensuring that these poor people, the have-nots of our society can access the legal system? For ensuring this, our Supreme Court came up with the modality of public interest litigation, where Citizens can take up cases on behalf of the poor and the downtrodden, where citizens can also take up cases where common rights of the public at large are infringed or some civil wrong is committed. And in both these scenarios, 
vigilant members of public or certain lawyers can approach the court by way of PIL. They do not have to prove their standing. The rule of locus is relaxed. And this PIL is an innovation of Indian judiciary for increasing access of the have-nots to our courts. And it has resulted in a lot of judicial activism, which you would be dealing with in another module. Another important trend which was initiated by the judiciary was the concept of basic structure doctrine. And this doctrine says that there are certain features of the Indian constitution, for example, the fundamental rights, which are so basic that no government can remove them, nor can any government amend them. So dear students, I hope you have thoroughly enjoyed the discussion today, which centered upon the origin of our judiciary, its structure, and briefly discussed some of the problems which we have faced and also some of the trends that have emerged in the recent years with regard to Indian judicial system. It is hoped, dear students, that you become aware of the importance of law and legal system in our country and become responsible citizens. Thank you.